Viking Women What was it like to be a woman in Viking society? Women in Viking society are among the most fascinating women in history. Not only were they the women with the most rights at the time, but they were also the holders of the treasure chest in the house, making them the de facto boss of the family's fortune. Women sometimes also participated in battle, but most important of all, they were the ones who taught the next generation how to be Viking. Women could also be a Jarl, a queen, a priestess, or have other important positions in society. So, what was it like to be a woman in the Viking era? Let's find out. Þetta er Víkingasaga með Magnus. Let's start at the beginning of life. When a woman was giving birth, the other women in the village would help and assist her, and the birth would happen with only women present. Men were not permitted to be present at the birth, this was 100% the women's responsibility. The death rate for children was high in Viking society and it is estimated that about 50% of the children died before the age of 12. Giving birth, without any modern medical assistance, were also risky for the woman, if the birth was complicated, the lives of not only the child, but also the woman was at stake. To help bring the child into the world, the women would chant, have special items that they believed had magical powers and sing songs. This was to protect the mother-to-be, from pain and difficulties during labor. A host of mythical traditions were also called upon, to get the gods' help and favor. Women often had children at a young age and went through frequent pregnancies, increasing the risk of complications and the health of the mother. When the child was born, it would be checked if it was healthy and had no deformities. If there were no issues with the baby, the child would live, if not, the baby would be left out in the woods to die. Growing up, the Viking children were like most other children, playing games and learning some of the things they needed in life. For a girl, this meant things like making yarn for clothes, preparing food, making jewelry and other things they needed in their daily lives. When the child reached the age of 12, there was a big celebration, both because they had survived their childhood, but also because this was the age you were considered an adult and you would start doing the things the grown-up women did. As the men often were away from the farm either as raiders, hunters, traders, or as fishermen, the women would be responsible for handling the farm, the home and of course the slaves. They would also have to defend the farm if it was attacked, or from thieves who came to steal your animals. Because of this, many Viking women learned to handle different weapons from an early age. Before I continue, I would like to explain for those who don't know, your opportunities in life in the Viking era very much depended on what social class you belonged to. Before Christianity took its hold on Viking society, the Jarl of course was on top of the social ladder, followed by the nobility. One more step down, you had free people and most people in Viking society belonged to this class. Free people ranged from rich to very poor. A rich free man would act very much like the nobility, hiring poor free people to work and take care of the farm. Poor people who didn't own a farm would often work for a richer family, the nobility, or the Jarl himself. They would live in the longhouse with the family they worked for, and along with the others that worked on the farm. Even though your status was free, your life was not unlike the slaves with a lot of work and chores in daily life. The difference being that you had a better bed, ate better food and was treated with respect. Kjónabant. Viking women were usually married when they were between 14 and 18 years old. Often, but not always, to a boy or man that was some years older than her, between 2 to 5 years older seems to be the most common. Some people married out of love, but as the child of a jarl, king, or a noble man, you would often have prearranged marriages. This was an important way to make alliances and create powerful family connections and therefore this wasn't really voluntary, but if you were lowborn, you had a better chance to marry someone you loved. A marriage was arranged in two stages, the betrothal and the wedding. The initiative had to come from the man or his father, who would make the proposal of marriage to the woman's father or guardian, and the groom promised to pay the bride price, called Munter. in Iceland the minimum. Munter. Payment was 8 ounces of silver, in Norway it was 12. 
In return, the bride's father promised to hand over her dowry at the wedding. Both the bride price and the dowry remained the property of the bride after the wedding. The two men shook hands on the agreement in front of witnesses and agreed a date for the wedding, usually within a year. The woman's consent to the marriage might be sought, but it was not necessary. Marriage was, at least among the wealthy, meant to create ties and alliances. The motives could be practical, economic or political, love in these cases, had little or nothing to do with it. The wedding, or Brutle, which means to run home with the bride. The wedding was a feast that lasted for many days, where family and friends celebrated the confirmation of the Flocksmarkmith, betrothal. This was a chance for the Vikings to celebrate and party, and they certainly celebrated it all they could. There were food and drinks, music and dance, games and good stories. But, like in a modern wedding, there probably were an uncle, who had too much to drink and started a brawl or maybe even a home gang. After the festivities, the Festerman, the groom and the Festermöi, the bride, were led to a common bedding, where they for the first time, at least officially, would share a bed. The marriage was considered legally binding when the couple had been seen going to bed by a minimum of six witnesses. Who said that romance was dead? Viking women were among the women in the world with the most rights at that time. A woman could divorce her husband and didn't have to give a better reason than that she was unhappy with him. I will come back to that later in this presentation. Women could also be a jarl or queen and with this status, they could also speak at the Althingi. the Viking equivalent to a modern parliament, something other women could not do. Women were also the holders of the key to the family's treasure chest, making them the de facto boss of the household's fortune. The men had to ask their wife to open the chest if he wanted something from it. I guess some things never change. When important women were buried, they were buried according to their status, this meant that important women also were buried in lavish graves. This is evident in the graves that have been found in both Norway and Sweden. The person buried with the Osberg ship in Norway was thought to have been a man for a hundred years, but to the archaeologists' big surprise, it was a woman. The Osberg ship grave was so lavish that it had to be a jarl or a queen. The same discovery was made in Sweden when a grave was uncovered in Gotland. Believed to be a man since it was found, DNA tests concluded that it was the grave of a woman. This was also a lavish grave, and tells us that this was a very important person. If a marriage was an unhappy one, it could be ended by a divorce, though this does not seem to have happened very often. On the face of it, divorce was a simple procedure, all that was required of the person who was seeking a divorce, was to summon witnesses and declare himself or herself divorced. That some Vikings had several lovers, probably led some outsiders such as Adam of Bremen, who in the 11th century, accused the Scandinavians of practicing polygamy, even though pagan marriage contracts recognized only one legal wife. When the feelings of the bride and groom weren't taken into consideration when two people married, you might expect that quite a few would seek love elsewhere. And surprise surprise, they did. Where love, sex and adultery were concerned, Vikings had a certain kind of double standard. A wife's adultery was a serious matter, and in some places the husband had the right to kill both her and her lover if they were caught together. But, there was no penalty for a man if he kept a concubine or lover, or had children outside marriage. We find the same double standards, or contradictions, expressed in the accounts of Adam of Bremen from 1070 AD. According to him, adultery was punished by death, saying, Men are sentenced to death for committing adultery, while women are sold as slaves, and rape of virgins was punishable by death. Nevertheless, men were permitted to take mistresses and the same Adam of Bremen wrote that Every man has two, three or more wives at the same time, depending on his wealth and fortune. Those who are rich and affluent have innumerable wives. But, we also have to keep in mind that Adam of Bremen was a Christian, describing heathen traditions he hadn't seen himself, and wrote this almost a hundred years after Scandinavia had become Christian. 
and also that there were different laws and practices all over the Viking world. Norway, for example, didn't have the same laws for the entire country until 1276 AD, when Magnus Lagabitte, meaning lawmaker, made Landsloven, meaning the law of the land. The sagas confirm some of the things Adam of Bremen says, it was in a way socially accepted that some men had mistresses or friller. but we also know that an unmarried woman could have children, without this ruining her chances of getting married. Ah, friller was a long-time mistress that lived together with a man at the same time as he had a wife. Sometimes these mistresses were of a lower class than the man, and therefore, a marriage between them was unacceptable. But sometimes these women were from the nobility and from the same social layer as the man she chose to connect with. No matter which social class the woman was from, the child of these lovers had the same rights to inherit as legitimate children of the man. It was forbidden by law to make Mansonk, meaning maiden song or love poem. If a Skult wrote a poem like that, he could be outlawed or even risk a death penalty. There were two reasons for this, the first was that a love poem could destroy a woman's reputation and insult her family, which was a very serious matter in Viking society. The second reason was that the Vikings were very superstitious and believed that the words of such a poem had magical power that could enchant or put a spell on the woman mentioned in the poem. Some Vikings actually had poem battles, insulting each other as best they could, and it was a terrible loss of honor to lose such a battle. In one example we hear of two Skult, who are fighting each other with a poem battle. But after the battle, one of them believes he has read one less poem than his adversary. This was something he couldn't accept and thus challenged the other to home gang. Skeltmeir. There are also stories about women fighting in battles and being just as brave as the men. One of the most famous of these was of course Lagerthe, made famous by the TV show Vikings. Thanks to Saxo Grammaticus, Gesta Denorum, we know of a legendary shield maiden known as either Lagertha or Lagerda. This legendary woman was part of a larger group of female warriors who volunteered to help the renowned hero Ragnar Lothbrok to avenge his grandfather's death by rushing into battle and slaughtering countless enemies, resulting in a great victory. Another fierce shield maiden was Freitis Eriksdottir. She appears in two stories in the so-called Vinland sagas, both of them recount stories that are a blend of history and legend about the Viking settlement of Iceland, and later Greenland, before moving on to Vinland in North America. Freitis Eriksdottir is among the explorers in both sagas, but they give very different accounts of her. In one, she is heavily pregnant and scares off a group of attackers by waving a sword at them. But in the other, she is manipulative, ruthless and supposedly murdered a group of defenseless women, in cold blood. No matter which one of these sagas is correct, or none of them at all, Freitis is a fierce tough-natured woman in both accounts. Deva. When you died and hopefully went to Valhalla, you got a burial according to your wealth and status. Rich people had servants to take care of them when they got old, but if you came from a poor family, they might struggle to feed and take care of you and you would in this way become a burden. In some cultures, we know that old people sometimes would go out in the wilderness to succumb to the elements, and in this way, unburden their family with one less mouth to feed. And we do have one mention of similar sacrifices in the sagas too. And also knowing that Vikings would leave children they didn't want, out in the woods to die, a sacrifice by the old like this, either voluntarily or because they were pressured by their family, is certainly a possibility. And as usual, the Vikings did it in their own special way. This was called Aethestup, meaning genus dive or kinfolk dive. This meant that you would jump off a cliff to have a quick death, help your family, and this was a very honorable thing to do. But, this is a controversial subject among Viking historians, with some believing that these are just tall tales from the sagas, while others believe this was practiced, at least in some parts in the Viking world. For a better illustration on what this was all about, I'll leave you with a scene from the TV show, Norsemen.
er det dags for etterstup. Noen som føler seg kaldt å være førstemann. Bjørn, gamling, du er jo eldst. Kanskje du skal ta ansvar og hoppe først? Altså, hvis det er noen andre som vil, så, så skal du få lov til det, altså. Det er noen andre som har lyst til å være fus? Nei. Bjørn kan... Uh... Ok, hvis ingen andre har lyst, så, så, så får jeg vel hoppe, da. Det er, det er mye her i dette her, er ikke? Ja, ja, vet du. Og ta etter stup. Det er noe av det mest ærefulle du kan gjøre. Ja, det er veldig viktig, vet du. Uh... Skal vi bare trekke unna bak deg, så om Bjørn får litt løpefart? Ja, ja, da... Ses vi på andre siden, da, Karin. Ja, vi snakkes. Til hvala! Hva er det jeg står på, så? I hope you liked this presentation, and if you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I cover a lot of Viking themes on my channel, but also other history, so please check out my other videos to see if there are some topics that might interest you. And I hope to see you in the next one. Skull.